Almighty God, we have come into your presence this morning. We know that you are here, for you have said, where two or more are gathered, there you shall be also. God, we're grateful for your spirit among us. Grateful for the spirit of those who have gathered for worship this morning. May our spirits together be pleasing to you. And may your spirit open our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear, and our hearts that we may truly know and understand all you have to say to us in this place on this beautiful morning. For we offer ourselves in worship in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith with the historic confession, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have children with you this morning, I hope you'll let them come spend a few minutes with me. <laughs> let the rest of our friends come in. Good morning. So this morning, I'm kind of talking to our, our, our children and our adults during children's time. Um, I've been praying and thinking for a long time that, that uh, I've been here a little over a year now, and we've had a great first year. And when we first started, we didn't, have, we didn't even have a children's sermon, but now we have all these children that are coming, and it's so exciting. And, and this was truly a surprise for me this morning that my friends from boot camp came, but I've been talking to them because one of the things that I feel like is important is that the more people we can bring into these walls, the more people we can, the more that we can do for people beyond these walls. And so in October, we're going to have a challenge. And that challenge is that I want to have at least 200 people in worship every Sunday. There are five Sundays in October. And so if we have 200 in worship every Sunday for five Sundays, that means we'll have over 1,000 people that would come and worship God in this place during the, during the month of October. Now, October is going to be a little bit of a challenge because on October 9th, there's going to be, on Sunday, October 9th, there's going to be a parade um, that stages out behind our church. And so it's going to be a challenge to get to church. But I'm going to work with everybody to try to make sure everybody knows that we're having church and that we can get here. And then on October 30th, I don't even, some of my friends may be running the Atlanta, anybody who's running the Atlanta Marathon? Anybody running the Atlanta Marathon? Baker, you're not running the Atlanta Marathon? Our marathon man, so... But the Atlanta Marathon will be on October 30th. It's not near our church, but it's all around Atlanta. It's very exciting, but it may make it a little more difficult for some folks to get in from like Decatur and out Stone Mountain Way or some of the places where our folks live. But I think it's important that we continue to try to fill these pews and fill this chancel well with children on Sunday mornings because, again, it's important that we all know God, that we know God's will for our lives, and that we then help other people come to know God. That's really why, what we exist to do. I wrote on my Facebook page one day this week that life is really all about relationships. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's our relationship with God and our relationship with our moms. Yeah, well, I, know I can tell you about that too. Um, relationship with God, with our, with our parents and our families, and with our friends. And then those folks that we come together with at church, which are family and friends, because we're all children of God. So I want y'all to do me a favor. I want you to make sure that you're here and your moms and dads are here, and that you invite friends to make sure that each and every Sunday we have as big a crowd as possible during the month of October. Will y'all help me do that? 
Will y'all help me do that? So we're going to work hard in October to make sure that we fill this place up as the best we can because there are incredible things happening at Atlanta First and we want to make sure that we continue to have enough people to do the things that God's calling us to do. So I thank y'all for being here this morning. Will y'all bow your heads and you repeat after me in prayer? Dear God, thank you for our church. Help us to invite our friends to come to know you and worship you as we offer ourselves in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, y'all can head out to Children's Church and go and sit with your parents.
So again, forgive me that the, the sound wasn't working. There was some great music that went behind that, but uh, hopefully you, most of you could see that in the that uh, short video that you can also see on the um, United Methodist Children's Home website, but just described a little bit of what our offering, the, um, the, the, the workday offering goes to support the United Methodist Children's Home. For you, those of you that are not familiar with the ministry, it's one of the oldest of its kind anywhere, but certainly in the state of Georgia. It is at times uh, operated as, as what we would think of as a traditional orphanage, um, and, uh, but it's, it, throughout the years, its primary focus has been on children. Now it's expanded into families and teens, and, and all of it is surrounded around helping people get back on their feet who have, who have faced difficult circumstances. And so it's an op- opportunity to give a second mile offering to that this morning and hope that you will consider doing so. And um, you've got the insert there that describes a little bit more about that. Uh, a couple more announcements that I um, wanted to remind us of is that we will have our church council meeting today at 1.15. Following lunch, we have lunch, um, fellowship hall, following worship. We'll make sure everybody is aware of that. And certainly want to remind you, if you've not yet done so, to fill out uh, your attendance registration and place that offering plate when those come by. Also, um, wanted um, to remind you um, to pay attention to your prayer list there on the back of your bulletin and be aware of all those who are in need of our prayers um, and also in the, the beautiful altar flowers that are placed this morning in memory of um, in honor of loved ones. And uh, certainly if there are prayer requests you have, I invite you to find the prayer request card that's located in the pew back in front of you. Fill that out and place it in the offering plate so that we also may, pray, may be praying for you about those needs as well. Will you join me with me now as we go to God for our morning prayer? Almighty God, we do thank you for the opportunity to worship. We thank you for the opportunity to gather with family and friends in this place to learn more about you and to draw closer to one another. God, we we come this morning on a beautiful fall weekend where the temperatures have become cooler and the leaves are beginning to turn. There's a distinctive chill in the air in the mornings. Over the next few weeks, it'll give way to just a glorious burst of color as trees and leaves continue to change colors for their winter sleep. As the air seems to be a bit clearer and crisper. Oh God, we give thanks for those seasons of life. Those seasons each year and also the seasons of life in which we find ourselves. Whether it's a new job or a new relationship, a new opportunity, a new challenge. We give you thanks that you are there with us each and every step of the way. Oh God, this morning we pray for those around our country and throughout the world who who need our prayers. Certainly remember those in Nevada this week who lost their lives in the tragic accident at the air show and those that continue to try to recover from their injuries. God, we are reminded to remember this morning as we do each week men and women who stand in harm's way this morning, both here at home and again throughout the world, men and women who represent our country, who work hard to bring peace to every corner of the world, to protect us and defend us. Bring them home safe, O God, and be with their families as they are apart. God, be with this congregation. We certainly lift up to you our challenge of October, where we are going to work hard to bring more people into relationship with you through this fellowship. God, help us to remove any obstacles we might have in getting here. Help us to be here, not for our own sake, but for yours. Oh God, we ask you for, to forgive us when we've fallen short of your grace and your mercy. And now we ask you to receive these, your tithes and our offerings. God, we recognize that all that we have was created by you and is a gift from you. Accept these, our gifts, bless them and multiply them. And give us the discernment and the grace to know how best use them to make a difference for others in your world. We offer all of this to you in the name of Christ our Lord, who taught us that when we gather we should pray with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Amen. Um. 
Before I read the scripture, I have a story to tell you that has absolutely nothing to do with the sermon, but I know Zach wanted me to tell it, and since I have all my friends from boot camp here, I thought I would tell it, share it with you. So Tuesday morning, I guess it was, we head out from boot camp, and Chip always has something up his sleeve, and so we take off in a direction that we never go. And we're running all together, and we run down across a little creek over a little bridge and out onto a baseball field, and he takes us around the fence, and as we lay down in the grass to do some leg exercises, we start hearing the distinctive sound of sheep and goats in the middle of Buckhead. And apparently there are companies now that you can hire to come bring sheep and goats to your property as an environmentally friendly way to clear kudzu and other brush. And so at 6.30 in the morning, these dogs were barking their heads off at us, wondering why in the world we were disturbing them from their sleep. Um, We went back twice this weekend to visit the sheep and the goats. We met their handlers, and their, their dogs are Anatolian shepherds, which are specifically raised and bred to, to shepherd these sheep and goats. Um, and he says, if they're awake, they're eating. And so they will clear acres at a time, and it was just absolutely hilarious. Um, that has nothing to do with anything, but it, it was crazy to come around the corner, and here we are at 6.30 in the morning face-to-face with just a whole herd. There's like 60 of them in there um, that back in that area. And so it was completely hilarious. So if you, if you ha- want something fun to do after lunch and council meeting today, it's up in Peachtree Hills at the Peachtree Hills Park, just right at Lindbergh. And the goats are there, and they're just eating away. And it's become a fun family thing to do in the Gardner household this weekend. If you will, please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew's gospel, the 20th chapter, beginning in the first verse. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, a denarius, he sent them into the vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock in the morning, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, about three o'clock, he did the same. And at about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usually daily wage, a denarius. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received what they had been promised, the usual daily wage. When they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. 
Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first shall be last. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So these couple weeks, uh, we, we obviously, we had a series on priorities, and we worked through all of that for several weeks, and then last week we came together and acknowledged the events of September 11th, 2001, and we've got a couple weeks in between when we'll begin our series for October, when we will challenge ourselves to increase our worship attendance and increase our focus on our ministry here at Atlanta First. So we had a couple weeks, and, and um, I, I was... I was looking at different things we could do, and some of you know that one of the, one of the um, ways that preachers prepare for sermons is through the Revised Common Lectionary, a series of readings in a three-year cycle, and, and I, I looked at several weeks ago at, at the lectionary readings, and I, this is one of my favorite texts from which to preach. In fact, I think I've probably used it in my first year here being with y'all, um, but this is as rich a parable as there is in the Gospels. There are a lot of rich parables, and, and certainly this one stands alongside the, the prodigal son and the good Samaritan is, is those rich stories from, that we can use to preach in so many different directions. Um, but I, I, this one struck me at this particular time as, uh, as it talks about work and as we find ourselves in a country with high unemployment and are aware of those that have been without jobs or who are seeking employment. It, it certainly has something to speak to us about that. Um, we live in a world where we're constantly asking what's fair and how people should be treated, and this, this text certainly has a lot to say to us about that also. So I want to just begin working my way through this and kind of sharing some thoughts and, and ideas is from this particular parable. First, it's hard for many of us to imagine what it's like to just begin each day wondering where our work might come and how it might come and if it might come. And so the first thing that's important to remember is to remember that group of people that got up early in the morning and went out into the marketplace to try to see if just maybe they could pick up a few hours' work to make a little money to take care of their families. Many of us are, have friends or family that have have been through this in the last several years. And so the first thing that this text calls me to do is pray for those folks, to lift them up, to understand as best I can what they're dealing with, to remind ourselves that we're the church and we're called to be there for those that are in need. We certainly did that yesterday as we reached out to the people beyond these walls in a very small way, but in an important way nonetheless. And then there's this landowner. Um, there, there are characters in the Bible that, that get bad raps over time. And certainly, large landowners are those, among those who would get a bad rap in the Bible. Uh, these, these people that owned huge pieces of property and seemed to wield their power over people. But the reality was that this landowner had a piece of property and he needed workers. And he went out and found people to come and work on his property, paid them a denarius, which wasn't an exorbitant amount. It was, as it says in the text, the usual daily wage, about what would have been the normal daily wage for a person doing that kind of work in this time. So he goes out and he finds a group of people to come and work for the day. And they come and they begin early in the day doing what I believe is probably very difficult work, working on a farm and in a vineyard, uh, harvesting, doing the necessary work that is there to be done. But the landowner, at some point during the day, realizes that he's got more work than, than he has people, and he, so he goes back, and there's more people that need work, and so he invites them to come. And he does this several times throughout the day, up until just an hour before it's time to quit work. And he gathers another group of people to come and work. Now, you, you'll notice that the only group of people that are guaranteed anything are those that 
got offered a job first thing in the morning. The rest are really going out on faith because he says, come and I will pay you what is fair or what is just or what is right. But they go not knowing exactly what it is that they will make, but they take the risk because they know that anything is better than nothing and that it'll be a good day's work. For those of us familiar with this parable, we then know at the end that everybody lines up and the landowner has directed his manager to go to those that came last and pay them first. And they begin to get paid that full daily wage. Well, you can imagine what happens at the other end of the line. Those that have been working all day begin to get excited. If he's paying them a whole day's wage, how much more are we going to make? We worked all day in the sun beating down on us, and they only worked an hour. They start doing the math in their head, and I can only imagine where that took them. Yet as the manager works down the line, each and every person gets the exact same thing. And those who came first in the morning, they yell out, well, that's not fair. They begin to grumble and they argue with the landowner. And he looks at them and he said, did you not agree to work for the usual daily wage? Yeah, but, but that's before we knew that you were going to hire those guys at the end of the day. And he says, take what you've earned and go. I can't imagine, you know, we don't hear the conversation that goes on afterwards. At some point, these people disperse, and I suspect that the conversations went on long into the evening about what had just transpired. Those that had worked all day were still frustrated and angry that they shot, thought they should have earned more than those that went first in the day. And who knows what was in the minds of those that had only worked an hour and received an entire day's wage. I suspect a few of them were grateful and appreciative and recognized that they were very fortunate. I suspect some of them figured, hey man, I earned that and took it and did what they wanted to with it. I've often said, and you've heard me say this before, if there's one thing that I'm glad of in this world, or, or one of the things I'm glad of in this world, is that God is not fair. I don't want, I've said this to you before, I don't want God to be fair. If God is fair, then I don't have anything I've got. Because at the end of the day, if God is fair, it's not fair that one man dies for everybody else. If God is fair, it's not fair that I have the stuff I have when I've done nothing necessarily to earn it. In, in, when, when I say that, I mean in spiritual terms. Certainly, many of us work hard each day and we earn the wage that we have agreed to and we've worked hard to educate ourselves and to, to, to make opportunities for ourselves or take advantage of opportunities that have been put in front of us. But at the end of the day, as I said in my prayer this morning, God created all of us and all that is around us. And so if we look at what is fair, fairness begins hard, becomes hard to... to defined, particularly in the context of this parable. So, we have a landowner. Now, I'm careful with this landowner because we can go from two ends of the spectrum. We can kind of characterize him as just a mean, evil person who hires people at a subsistence wage and and we can let our mind go wild with what kind of conditions there are in his vineyard and how the workers are treated. By the way, none of which we get in this story. The other end of the spectrum is we can talk about how generous this man is and that he gave the people that came very end of the day the same thing that he gave those that came at the beginning of the day. And that may be giving the landowner a little too much credit. But certainly what Jesus is trying to do in telling us this parable is illustrating, us to, what, illustrating to us the gift of grace. And that gift of grace that is ours and that we are given and have things that we could never possibly earn on our own. That there are things that we have in life that are ours simply because they have been given to us by God. And so we explore grace in this parable. And, and, and these workers, you, you, you can characterize these workers from one end of the spectrum to the other too. 
You can characterize the workers early in the day as greedy, but if we're honest with ourselves, if we've agreed to do a job for a certain amount of money and we find out somebody is doing that same job for more money or even worse, is doing less of a job for the same money, we would be pretty frustrated. As I've observed over the past few years, Part of the challenge we have in our country and in the world in general is one of needing to find a place of contentment. We live in a world where we're always looking at what someone else has. If each of these persons is in a vacuum and they go and they work and they have no idea what each other are being paid, but they go and work and they work for a wage that they agreed to, and they take that wage and they go home and they're able to provide for their families without any knowledge of what anyone else got paid, then everybody probably walks away pretty happy. They're, they're, they're excited that they got the opportunity to work and they got the opportunity to earn some money, and, and they're happy. The problem comes when they compare each other, compare themselves to someone else. This is where it gets problematic, and that rather than being content to accept what they've been paid, they are frustrated because they feel as though relative to someone else, they've been treated unfairly. It gets very complicated. In fact, this, uh, this particular parable is handled in a book that I've, I've had for a number of years, and it's called Teaching the Difficult Sayings of Jesus. Because at the end of the day, as I said, not only is this rich a rich story, but it's a very complex story. As we deal with Jesus sharing with something with us that we can't fully get our arms around. There's issues of justice, there's issues of grace, there's issues of of jealousy, frustration. All of that wrapped up into this one story. Now, it's human nature. It's human condition to compare ourselves to one another. But as we continue to do that, and as we continue to try to keep up with one another, then the real problems begin to happen. There have been so many uh, stories over the past few years of people that have made decisions to simplify their lives. There was one family here in Atlanta that wrote a book about how the daughter really inspired them and, and they sold their home and they bought a home for half as much and they took the half of the money that, that they made and they put that into helping other people. They realized that they didn't need all the things that they had, but that over time as they continued to accumulate things and as they continued to be more successful in their business and in their doings, that they really had more than they could need. I, I'm a Georgia Tech fan, as most of you know, but Coach Mark Richt had a, a new home on the lake, and, and he sold that, and this kind of story gets overlooked in athletics all the time, but he made it clear that the reason they sold that was that they realized what could be done, as Mark Rick said, in the kingdom with that money at a house that they very infrequently used. Each of us, probably most of us in this room, at any given time, may have had more than what we really needed. Um, And and we have to look at that. And again, what this story does is not to dictate what we do, but what it causes us to do is to look inside ourselves and to look at what we have and to look at how that we share that with other people. I also want to be very careful at this point. I'm speaking specifically about the church right now. I'm not speaking about any other institution and what any other institution should do, governmental or otherwise. When I hear Jesus speak these words and teaching us about grace and teaching us about sharing with our brothers and sisters, Jesus is talking directly to us. Jesus is convicting each of us right where we are to do the very best we can to follow God, to take care of our families and reach out to others. 
as you know, there's a three-pronged stool that I kind of stand on in my life, and I've called us to stand on in ministry together. That three-pronged stool sits on the legs of integrity, service, and excellence. Integrity, integrity is being the people that God created us to be. Integrity is knowing who we are and doing what God has called us to do. Integrity means that when we are come to face to face with adversity, that we will know what to do. We won't have to think about it because we will be so convicted in who we are that we will know what to do. I've been reminded a lot recently. Adversity does not build character. Adversity reveals character. The way that people act in the face of adversity says a lot about who they are and what they believe and what they stand for. And we want to be prepared before we come face to face with adversity. We want to know how we will react and how we will act in the face of those challenges and obstacles. Service. No one can read the Bible in any part of the Bible and not come away with understanding that God calls us to serve one another. That that is the ultimate act that God calls us to. As I shared a couple weeks ago, Jesus himself washed the feet of the disciples. God calls us again and again and again and again to serve one another. Not reluctantly, not begrudgingly, but with a servant's heart with the Spirit of God. It's hard to do sometime. I've shared with you before a story, but I, I think it's appropriate in that um, uh, a friend once told me, I, we, we worked at City of Refuge for a long time. We've kind of taken a break from that. But one of the ministries that the City of Refuge has is the 180-degree kitchen. And what that ministry does is that it takes people from the neighborhood just to the west of us, and it it takes applications, and uh, over a certain period of time, it will take a certain number of people, and it will train them in culinary skills. And the incredible thing about the whole ministry is that it trains folks, and it also provides meals back to the community. So it's doing all kind of amazing things at one time. But this person I know tells a story of some folks coming through the line one day, Keep in mind that this is a meal plan that is provided for free to the community by people who are trying to help themselves out and to, to make a better lives for themselves. And it, and it reaches out to the, to the families in that neighborhood. And one woman's coming through the line and she's being very belligerent. She's complaining about the food, that it's not exactly what she wants or not to her liking or not enough and, so, and uh, as, as one person observes this, they, they've had enough of it. One of the persons that ran the kitchen walked up and they interrupted this scene and said, Ma'am, would you like your money back? She was given something for free, yet she was complaining about it. It wasn't exactly what she wanted, but it was prepared in love by people who were trying to make a difference in their lives and the lives of others. That's what is called to serve, but, but there's also a level of accountability that comes from all of us. So integrity and service and then excellence. Um, a lot of folks around here, I think, may tire of me talking about excellence. But I, I make a distinction between perfection and excellence. And just this week, I was talking to somebody and I, I get, you know, it's, it's wonderful to have these conversations because something new always comes to my mind. And this person said that excellence is relative and perfection is absolute. Excellence is relative and perfection is absolute. And if there's anything any of us probably can agree on, that there's nothing, very few, if anything, absolute in this world. That most everything is relative. Now, I'm careful to get into moral relativism because that's a very slippery slope. But what I, the way I've defined excellence is doing the very best we can, being the people that God's created us to be, given the resources that are at our disposal at any given time. And so it wraps integrity, service, and excellence all together. We've got to be the people we are. And we, we have the resources that we have at our disposal. And excellence says that we do the very best we can at any given time 
to be the people God's created us to be using the resources that are at our disposal. I've spent a lot of my life getting caught up in perfection. Perfection paralyzes me. It prevents me from doing something that otherwise would probably be, have the potential to be excellent, if not perfect. And I need to remind myself that sometimes excellence is a far better uh, thing to seek out. Perfection causes me to try to be somebody that I'm not with resources that I don't have. I can only do what I can do given the gifts that I've been given and the resources that I have. And so we think about these folks going to work this day We think about a landowner who gave all of those people an opportunity to work and earn. And these people who came and served, certainly for a wage, but they served. They helped the landowner and the landowner helped them. Now one of the ways that this text has been preached is that one of the illustrations that comes out of it the most is this idea of, of people that come into a relationship with God. Some people know God from the time they're born, and there are others that, as we come to know, the deathbed confession. (laughs) And there's some of us that think, wait, we've lived our entire life for God. We've lived as Christ has called us to live our entire lives. Yet you're telling me that if someone's lived their entire life as a scoundrel at the last moment, they profess their faith in Him, that they will receive the same reward that I do? I'm reminded of two things in that story. One, the people that got hired first thing in the day, they knew that they were going to make a wage that day and that they would be able to feed their families. Those who were left in the marketplace were left to sit and wonder and worry what would become of them that day. Think about the joy that is ours for those of us who have faith in a relationship with one another, and share all the beauty that is God's creation, and know that from the very earliest of our days to the very last breath that we draw, and think how sad it would be for someone to have lived their entire life without the knowledge and understanding and the peace that comes from knowing God and living in, through, and for God. And so... Really, at the end of the day, how do we dictate or how do we measure what is fair and not fair? Because all we can do is pray to God that God would direct us, guide us, give us the strength and energy to be the people that He's created us to be. We pray for our brothers and sisters and we're called upon to love them and serve them so that they too may come into relationship with God. But it's not for us to judge what they have or don't have, who they are or who they're not. That alone is left between them and God. I want to close with this story. There was a missionary returning back to China on a ship. And there was a corporate executive who was traveling on that same ship. And on this long journey on this boat... The businessman was impressed that this missionary's vast understanding of the culture and the, the, econo- the economy and, and the lives of those in China. He had a firm command of their language and their history and their customs. The businessman, just before they were to arrive in China, looked at the missionary and he said, Whatever the church is paying, I'll pay you five times as much to come and work for me. The missionary looked back at the businessman and said, I appreciate your offer, but I can't accept it. The businessman looked back and said, Is the salary not enough? Is it not big enough? To which the missionary replied, No. The salary is generous, but the job is too small. This man had been called to bring people into relationship with God. And there was no job bigger in his mind worth any amount of money that would supersede his call 
to bring people into relationship with God through Christ. God's realm is the same for all. The rewards are not payment for service rendered, but gifts which we do not earn. Clearly, some work for gain, others for gold, but some out of gratitude. May we work out of gratitude for all that's been given to us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of celebration this morning is hymn number 396. Will you stand with me as we sing the first and the last verses? <laughs> 